you very much. So I guess by the end of this, if you're not moved, I failed. Yeah, so, okay. You were crying last time. That's a high bar for me to hit. Um, you might not be able to see, so I might just move around so that different people in the audience can see what's behind me. Um, or oh, I better take a clicker as well. Right, so my name's Gavin Neat, and I am the CEO of a technology company, um, which explains why I didn't know there was a clicker that I needed to use. Anyway, um, I haven't always been the CEO of a technology company, uh, because for 10 years I was a military police dog handler, and then in 1996 uh, I became a guide dog mobility instructor. So my job was training people how to use guide dogs. Uh, which was a brilliant time to be doing that because the internet had been around for five years, so it was really cool. I could then write emails. I had a Pentium 100, which was an amazing... Has anybody ever had one of those? Well, yeah, okay. I said at the start, I said, yeah, I think there might be one person a similar age to me. But yeah, um, back kind of before the internet, I was going, I want to be a guide dog mobility instructor and train people how to use guide dogs. Um, but you can see from this photograph, maybe, that uh, I'm standing next to a pedestrian crossing and a guide dog owner is on the left-hand side of the pedestrian crossing. I'll move up here so you can see it. Um, and I'm showing you how far apart the guide dog owner is from the pole. And uh, as a guide dog mobility instructor, I'm following this guy and I'm going, right now, Murray, you've got to the down curb, which is the curb edge, and now you're going to press the button at the pedestrian crossing. And Murray does this. looking for the pole and the button. Uh, it's quite obvious to see that if Murray does that at this pedestrian crossing, Murray's in the road and Murray's getting hit by cars. So I say to Murray, on this situation, what do you do? He says, oh, well, there's a sequence here uh, and I just listen for the sequence. When the cars over there are going, these ones have stopped. When they then start again, as soon as they've stopped, the green man is on and I can then walk across this road. And I said, yeah, but they've installed this pedestrian crossing with that fantastic little tactile cone underneath, and you can use that, and that will help you across the road. And he went, yeah, but I don't use that. I just use the sequences. And it costs around about £1,000 per pole for this little button, and there's 200,000 of these in the UK. So it's quite an expensive proposition, and that doesn't even take into consideration installation. So I said at the time, um, wouldn't it be good if we could press the button digitally? Uh, in 2006, Apple iPhone came along and had voiceover, so I thought, well, all my guys were turning up to train with guide dogs, and they had mobile phones, and uh, it became obvious to me that the phone could press the button, and I just asked somebody if they could do that, and they said, yeah, you could do that, uh, and then we looked at how it was going to be done, and I gave them some money, and then they fixed it, and then somebody put some hardware into the button, and now there's an entire town in Scotland which became the very first pedestrian crossing in the world which was personalized to the user. Uh, and at that point, I was still working for Guide Dogs for the Blind, thinking about how am I going to have a company, because uh, I'd had to set a company up to get help, because I didn't have a clue about this stuff. Um, and uh, I realized that uh, I would have to leave Guide Dogs for the Blind, which was my dream job. Uh, and I was going to have to leave Guide Dogs for the Blind and actually do stuff in tech, which was not what I wanted to do. However, um, once I'd left Guide Dogs for the Blind, I was able to then look at some of the other problems that I'd had as a Guide Dog mobility instructor, and then I was able to look at how mobile technology could actually help people in those situations as well. When you are a guide dog mobility instructor or a social worker or an occupational therapist or a, um, let me see, a mobility instructor, maybe uh, you are actually doing something that other people don't do, which is follow your client from A to B. Doctors probably, or healthcare workers, they go to A. People sometimes go to B in order to get services, but very few people actually follow them from A to B. And when you follow people, you realize that the world that they live in has not been designed for them. And that's why I came up with Button, which is the pedestrian crossing system. But if you walk into a shop with somebody who's disabled and you step back from them and observe the interaction between them and the person in the shop, you see a very different world and the world that they live in. And Ken here on the screen um, would say to me, I'd walk into a shop, Ken's blind, he doesn't, he's got his cane under his arm there, but um, Ken would walk into a shop, uh, he would just stand there, because what's he going to do, go and try and find somebody? Uh, he would stand there, and five minutes later, when nobody came up to talk to him, he would just walk out again. Uh, and this was happening a lot, in fact, a lot. 75% uh, of disabled people have said that they've had poor customer service 
and left a shop prematurely, maybe not even buying anything at the time. Now everybody goes, oh, okay, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. But these guys are spending 249 billion pounds a year in the United Kingdom alone. 249 billion pounds a year that a lot of shops are missing out on. Uh, so I was thinking, why are they missing out on this? Why, when you walk into a shop, do you get really poor service? And there's a very good reason for it. It's because this is the traditional way of dealing with an incident. So somebody walks into a shop, uh, and the person discriminates against them for whatever reason. And we'll talk about the reasons in a second. But they just get discriminated against. Increasingly, nowadays, they go onto social media. And you should talk to Jonathan at the back here if you get a chance, just here. Jonathan's a guy who'll go and tell you, he'll tell you all about what he's just done today. But he went on social media, and he changed an entire council's policy on how they should deliver services to him, just with him tweeting about it. Now, what happens is they complain. There's an apology. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is really bad, because we don't want you PRing us to death on Twitter. Uh, there's then training, staff training. And then there's a period of time, and then the whole thing happens again. And the reason for that is because staff don't, train, don't stay trained forever, and you can't train them in every single situation they're going to come into contact with. It's impossible to do. Let's just say you're working in Fringe Festival, and you are delivering services in the Fringe Festival, and you're a student. Am I going to train you? If I work for the Fringe Festival, am I going to train you in autism, epilepsy, diabetes, dyslexia, cerebral palsy, mental health awareness, uh, visual impairment, hearing? Of course I'm not. I can't train you in all those things. And I certainly can't expect you to recall the training in the moment that you need to deliver a service. It just can't be done. But it's all we've had. And somebody said to me that, uh, well, they, they mentioned that Henry Ford, who you may have heard of, Henry Ford said, if I'd asked them what they'd wanted, they would have said faster horses. So this is Henry Ford Motor Company. He, apparently, he didn't say it, which ruins my, what I'm saying. But <laughs> it's apocryphal, apparently. But it's true. Uh, if you'd ask people what they wanted when they've had bad service, they say, oh, more staff training. But it doesn't work for that reason. Well, not that reason. The reason that was on a second ago. So what we did was we put a little bit of hardware uh, into a building. We put a geofence around a building. We had an app running. The person walked towards the building. They hit the geofence. A message went to the customer service team inside the building. The customer service team inside the building got information about the person who was just about to walk through the door. And they got staff training and awareness on the specific needs of the person, dictated by the person who was just about to walk through the door. Somebody who said, I want you to know that I am living with autism, and it's a really good idea if you could maybe do this, this, and this, and this, because that's going to be really useful to me. Now, again, a bit like the pedestrian crossing, which was the first in the world, uh, when I came up with this idea, I didn't realize that, again, I was going to be in the first in the world to actually do this, but I am and was the first in the world to do this, and uh, I suddenly started getting lots of people going, wow, that's really interesting, and my god, you're going to change customer service and how it's delivered, because I'm going to know who's going to walk through the door and how to interact with them. Uh, so we installed with a couple of places. We launched it in November 2017, and we're now installed with, in that last year, Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament went live last week, Northlink Ferries, Doubletree Hilton, House of Fraser, Royal Bank of Scotland, Nat West, Dundee Council, Stirling Council, Fourth Valley Sensory Centre, Guide Dogs of the Blind, RNIB, Headway Island, um, do, 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 Edinburgh Printmakers, uh, Fourth Valley Sensory Center, Sense, uh, Seascape. Um, oh, I've got this so many. If you go online, you'll see all these guys. But the one that we got really excited about was when the Minister for Social Affairs came up to us and said, uh, you should really be having that at Edinburgh Airport. Uh, so we installed it at Edinburgh Airport, and it became the first system in the world where the customer service team gets information on how they should interact with a person with any condition at all, completely uh, behind the scenes. In other words, you don't have to go up and say, hi there, I have this. Please. Well, you go into Starbucks, you walk up to, the, <laughs> up to the barista, and you say, hi there, I'd like a flat white, and I have schizophrenia. This is not going to work very well, certainly with the person going, what? Is that, put that on the cup? What do you want me to do? Um, so we installed it in Edinburgh Airport. Uh, where they have 88,000 people who declare 
uh, that they are disabled, but it will be plenty more. And it's probably worth pointing out that 75% of all disabled people, and there are 1 or 13 million people who would identify as being disabled in the UK, 20% um, of the Britain's population are disabled, uh, and 75% of those people have a hidden disability. So you wouldn't even know. They would have to tell you. So um, I practiced this earlier. I think I've done it. The technology uses GPS to alert staff that the customer is en route, giving them time to prepare for their visit and make any special arrangements. Dave Nicholson, Ken Reid lost his sight 30 years ago. Over the decades, getting around has become easier, but there are still issues. I feel a mobile, I walk a lot of places, and uh, I can walk the streets that I feel quite, quite comfortably, but finding a venue and getting into that venue and then getting the service that I require when I arrive at that venue, that's, that's the challenge is I stood there and, and, and they say I had to shout will somebody come and help me and it's very degraded when you have to do that and making that last 50 meter connection between um, your, your, your journey and arriving at your final destination is just it's, it's closing that loop that makes it, it, it makes the whole difference that's where the new welcome app comes in it allows people to set up a personal profile which alerts a venue when they're en route and outlines what they require when they get there. The big picture here is we're all humans, we're exactly the same. Check the we should all be equal, we should be treated equally, and everybody should be equal by default. So it's equality by default that we're aiming for within the service that we offer. Edinburgh Airport has become the first Scottish airport to register with it. If we can use technology to help us understand the needs of individual groups, and of course disabled have got the most pressing needs, and certainly the ones we need to support and want to support as much as we can, then we can just keep offering better service. Hey, the Scottish Government is encouraging other businesses to follow suit. What we need is more and more people to know about this app and to want to use it and then to place demands on the companies and businesses that offer services that they should have it so that individuals can have that accessibility. It's off this new link with Edinburgh Airport will encourage other venues to take it on board, empowering hundreds of people like Ken to live as independently as possible. Kay Nicholson, STV News, Edinburgh Airport. So when I worked with Guide Dogs to the Blind, I was surrounded by um, companies that made bits of kit that cost disabled people money that was a tax on them. So they had to have more money for the software they had on their uh, smartphone or their website, wherever it was. And I thought, no, I never want people to have to pay for this. This should not be a tax on a disabled person. So everything I do is totally free. It's a free app that you download, uh, and everything is paid for by the business. And of course. Uh, we're, a SaaS, we're a SaaS model company, so the business is actually only paying around about £30 a month, and we make them totally accessible as far as social interaction is concerned for the person who's walking through the door. Uh, the other thing that we've done, uh, which I absolutely love, is uh, the fact that within the app, you can request where you want the venue next. So what we've actually got is an increasing number of people across the United Kingdom who are saying, I want this installed in my local shop. My bank needs to have this. My council needs to have this. My government needs to have this. My post office needs to have this. And we now have um, what they term themselves as neat box ninjas, uh, which are people who are going around the country saying, I demand this. And they dictate how society interacts with them, possibly for the first time in a long, long time, if not forever. So that's what I do. Um, we've got so much going on. We're working at LNER and... Uh, First bus to install it on buses, LNER, to put it in train stations. We're working with NatWest, Royal Bank of Scotland are looking at spreading it. We're also in Ireland now as well. Uh, and there's no reason why this can't go around the world because it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, feel free to, oh, lost my clicker. Feel free to um, use our hashtag, which amazingly didn't exist until January, February time. Arrival anxiety, or ending arrival anxiety, or an end to arrival anxiety because we all suffer anxiety at some point in our lives. The disabled people suffer it a hundred times worse, especially if they've been discriminated against the previous time that they visited somewhere. Thank you.